The premiere of this work, commissioned by the fourth Huenca Week of Religious Music, took place on Holy Thursday, the 15th of April, 1965. The work scored for three sopranos, men's chorus, and an orchestra consisting of strings without violins, two flutes, celesta, vibraphone, timpani, and percussion. The music of this hymn is based on a scale formed of nine notes, the first symbolic number, B, F, A, C, D, E, F, G, and C, although the composer is not bound by the symbolism suggested by the text. This, in a very special and unexpected way, leads to the final cadence on a chord of A major, or a tierce de picardie, as the French Baroque masters would have called it, although I'm happy to say that this work has nothing of that style about it. As a result, there's no place here for any Gregorian or Ambrosian influence, which would, in any case, have made impossible that beautiful and eternal heavenly invocation of the psalm which, for purely musical reasons, is not included here in its entirety. The second symbol is to be heard in the delicate, repeated notes uttered by the celesta, D, F, G, D flat, F, E, C. And finally, the third of the symbols is the prayer to the three archangels, symbolized by the three soprano voices who hover above, protecting, by reason of their divine nature, the men's chorus, those disciples of Qumran, ascetics, sages, and tenacious watchers of the stars and the sky so eternally mysterious to mankind. I've also tried to follow the musical dictates of the new liturgy, as in my forthcoming Mass for Men's Chorus, Trumpets, Horns and Trombones, which harmonises the divine song of the three archangels with the choir's psalmody. To conclude, the orchestra is treated with the greatest restraint, reduced to the minimum possible for this poetry which is so laden with symbols. The percussions, deployed not for its bell-like sounds, but at times in an expressive way, as in the case of the vibraphone, which is here used in a virtually symbolic role. I wanted to associate myself with this beautiful hymn, and I can assert that my humble music is nothing more than this Franciscan humility in the presence of the beauty of this psalm of the disciples of Qumran. A few kilometres to the south of Jericho, near the ancient ruins of Kibet Qumran, in the Judean desert, the young shepherd boy, Muhammad Adib, a Bedouin of the tribe of Ta'amira, climbing after a goat that had been lost among the crags of Jebel, discovered in a narrow cave the jars which contained the famous Dead Sea Scrolls. Since 1947, the date of their discovery, the greatest in modern times, as Lancaster Harding affirms, these ancient rolls of parchment have caused veritable oceans of ink to be spilled around the world. Archaeologists, theologians, paleographers, philosophers and poets have discussed, disputed and almost come to blows with one another. Today, 15 years later, the storm has abated and these rolls of incalculable value are resting at last in the temperature-controlled rooms of the Jerusalem Museum. Among the seven rolls discovered in the first of the Qumran caves, many more would be found later on in the caves nearby, they also found, in addition to the very ancient book of Isaiah and the commentary of Habakkuk, a collection of psalms of thanksgiving, together with the Book of the Law, also called the Manual of Discipline. And this last book ends with the extremely beautiful psalm, which Theodor Gasta has called Hymn of the Disciples of Qumran, the first verse of which was chosen by Joaquin Rodrigo for his composition of the same name. Who might the inspired author of this strange poem have been? What we know today for certain is that he belonged to the Qumran sect. This was probably formed just before the reign of John Hyrcanus, 135 to 104 BC, and died out shortly before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, 70 AD. 
Its origins date back to a schism among the priests in Jerusalem after the coming to power of Alexander Yaneus, the king priest of Judea, 103 to 76 BC. A group of priests, faithful adherents to the ancient law, refused to recognize as their supreme priest a warrior king whose guilty hands were stained with blood. These pious men, called Hasidim, preferred to retreat to the desert, where they elected as the supreme priest of Israel the one to whom they gave the title Lawgiver. Beside the Dead Sea, they built a monastery where they founded a small community of sages and ascetic philosophers united there to dedicate their lives to praising God and to penitence. They kept vigil for much of the night in order to fervently pray and to study the mysteries of the vault of heaven and the movement of the stars, observing faithfully the precept of the new alliance. From the commentary of Habakkuk, we learn that the second lawgiver, whose strong personality can be sensed from the manuscripts, was taken from his refuge on the Day of Atonement by Alexander Yaneus himself, who condemned him to be crucified, handing him over to his mercenaries, together with all the others who would not recognize his authority. According to Dupont Sommer, this amounted to some 6,000 people. The writers of the commentaries tell us that this cruel punishment which was used in the Roman Empire was imposed for the first time in Israel on this very occasion by the cruel tyrant. Commentary of Habakkuk. Might there not be found amongst these martyrs for their faith the anonymous author of the Hymn of the Disciples of Qumran, in whose ancient verses there's already reflected together with the love of God as creator of the world with all its natural wonders, that profound lyrical beauty and those mystical elements, which we will find again many centuries later in the poetry of San Juan de la Cruz and Fray Luis de León. <laughs> 